Good evening, everyone. Welcome to another Poetry Book Society online Instagram book club. My name's Andrew McMillan. I'm here with Patricia. I've adjusted the camera angle this time, and so you get a better picture of Patricia, and we'll be able to see exactly when she falls asleep and exactly when she becomes excited by the conversation and about what we're talking about. So welcome and thank you as always for joining us. It's a new month, but it's the same old format um, for this Poetry Book Society online book club, except um, there's a couple of changes or a couple of things that we're going to do differently this time. First of all, I've been given the great responsibility of announcing the Autumn 2020 Poetry Book Society selections, and so I will do that very shortly. That's a great weight that rests on my hand. I'm tempted just to say that each of them are books that I've written and published, but that would be unfair, and so I will announce other poets as being recipients of those selections. But also, tonight we're talking about the wild card. Um, talking about the wild card, which is um, a relatively new kind of feature of the Poetry Book Society and um, came about as a way of trying to sort of expand the reach, perhaps, of the sort of books that were considered um, in Poetry Book Society selections. I actually, two or three years ago now, was asked to choose the first ever um, Poetry Book Society um, wildcard choice. And I chose Wayne Holloway Smith's debut collection, Alarum, um, when I did it. And so it's really nice that we've almost come full circle. And now we're going to be talking about the summer 2020 wildcard choice, and um, which has gone to Wayne Holloway Smith again um, for his second collection with Rolex Love Minus Love. And we're going to talk a little bit about that um, very shortly. Um, so... I mean, what could possibly go wrong? Basically, what I'm going to do is I'm going to first have a chat with Anthony Anaxagoru, who's a poet, brilliant poet, who many of you will know, and he's in charge of choosing the wildcard choice. And so I want to have a chat to him about what goes through his mind when he kind of is looking for a wildcard to select, what sort of stuff he's looking for, and then have a chat to him about Wayne's book. And then Anthony will leave us, and then I'm going to bring Wayne in. Um, and we're going to have um, a chat between me and Wayne. So if anyone was here for the last one and they saw the kind of drama that ensued when I tried to invite one poet into a conversation when I was chatting to Barney Cappell a couple of weeks ago, we can only imagine the joy of technical brilliance that's going to happen when I try and chat to two poets over the course of one hour, which is great. But Anthony has chosen some incredible books um, over the course of... Um, his tenure as selecting the um, wild card and I just wanted to kind of list some of them off because it's almost a who's who of poetry over the last few years so Jennifer Wong's book Mimi Calvati Daniel McHale Inua Ellums Fiona Benson Sophie Robinson Zafar Cunil just to name a few have all been wild card choices um, of Anthony Annex Agoru's and of course this time um, Wayne Holloway Smith as well and so it's such a massive um and a list of poets that have that wild card um, kind of selection within the Poetry Book Society as well. And so my job, first of all, before I bring Anthony in, is to, I think, tell us about the... Um, Tell us about the autumn choices. And so again, I'll kind of run through how it happens. We, the selectors, um, so this time myself and Sinead Morrissey. So Sinead Morrissey, the great poet Sinead Morrissey, joining us for the first time. We sit down with all the books on our computer screens. It's done digitally. Um, and we look through them and then we get together and we discuss them and we argue about them. Um, and and we end up kind of having to choose some, which is always a terrible thing. It's like any shortlist or any kind of listing at all. You always wake up in the middle of the night thinking about the book that didn't quite make it or the book that should have been on there but maybe isn't and then you kind of wrestle with yourself about about the books. But each of these books I think really is deserving of their place. I hope that as Poetry Book Society members you're going to get a chance to, to read all of them um, or at least some of them. And I should say for those of you that are watching as always who aren't yet Poetry Book Society members do sign up. There's still the offer on at the minute where if you sign up and become a member in Poetry Book Society, you get a free £10 voucher to spend in their shop, you'll get the free tote bag and you'll get a copy of the Summer Bulletin, and which has got a write-up about Wayne's book and all the books that we've been discussing over the last few weeks. And so this probably is the last Poetry Book Society Instagram book club that we're going to do about the Summer Books, and we're going to move on to the Autumn Books after this week. And because it's poetry, it has to be a little bit different. And so when I say Autumn... The Poetry Book Society 
thinks that autumn is books that are published in July, August and September. So July, August and September. Now, we can argue about whether, whether they're really the months of autumn or not, um, but write your letters to somebody else because I just do what I'm told. And so for Poetry Book Society reasons, um, as it's always been for a long, long time, um, the season of autumn counts as July, August and September. Um, and the pamphlet choice each um, each season, which you'll have just seen has been announced for summer, is always announced slightly later. Um, and that's because pamphlets often have a kind of different publishing schedule. They're often um, kind of slightly... Um, slower or kind of slightly behind the book publishing they often happen quicker and so the pamphlet choice um that the great wonderful nick mccoa and the wonderful mary jean chan the pamphlet choice that they choose for autumn will be announced um slightly further down the line um but i'll just take us through the um autumn 2020 choices first of all and first of all in the um translation category so those of you that are members of the pbs might be members of the translation section um of that of that membership where you get sent translation choices every time and actually this time it's there's two there's a co-translation winner so it's like um that time that they gave the golden globe to two different people um and so the co-translation winners are in no particular order um or the co-translation selections pardon me three books by mesandel virtusio aguelas translated by christine ong muslim it's going to be published by Broken Sleep Books. And then 10 Contemporary Spanish Women Poets um, that's going to be published by Shearsman, and that's edited and translated by Terence Dooley. And so they're the two translation choices for Autumn. And then the special commendation, and we talked about this a bit when we talked about Grace Nichols' book, so the special commendation is a book which perhaps doesn't fit the single poetry volume kind of mould. It's something a bit different, a bit weird. And this time... The special commendation has gone to Gerda Christney for a book called Requivac Requiem, which is published by ARC. And those, if anyone's been kind of following Gerda Christney's work, it's the third part of a kind of Icelandic noir trilogy of kind of odd translated, um, just astonishing work that didn't quite feel like it fit into a, a normal kind of um, single collection category. And so the special commendation for autumn 2020 is Gerda Christner's Requiem that's published by ARC. Um, and so then on to the four commendations um, this time. And the first one of those, again, in, in no particular order, just whatever catches my eyes, I look at my other screen, is Kate Miller, the Long Beds, published by Carcanet. That's Kate Miller's second collection. Um, I was lucky enough to um, publish my debut collection in the same year as Kate. We um, I don't think I've, we've ever met, in fact, but it's a name that um, has been around for a while, and this is the second collection, The Long Beds, by Carcanet, and it occupies that collection, I think, a strange kind of world between waking and sleeping. It's a kind of oddly... Um, a book that's very hard I think to put your finger on because it exists in that very strange world that you only inhabit just before you wake up fully but you're not asleep anymore and that's where Kate Miller's second book The Long Be Beds um, inhabits the next um, poetry book society recommendation for autumn 2020 is Mervyn Taylor and Country of Warm Snow that's published by Shearsman and Mervyn Taylor is a poet that was new to me um, and that's my kind of bad because it's just a remarkable book um, and one that I encourage everyone to read. Just such a clear eye of vision, such a clear eye of description. Um, and so the second um, Poetry Book Society recommendation for Autumn 2020 is Mervyn Taylor's Country of Warm Snow and that's published by Shearsman. The third um, Poetry Book Society recommendation for autumn 2020 is Sean Borrowdale's Inmates, published by Jonathan Cape. And those that have been following Sean's work for quite a while will know that he does these very um, kind of intense studies, oftentimes in one place or one thing. So if we think of Asylum, which was about kind of the underground world, if we think about human work that was about the kitchen, about cooking, or Bee Journal, perhaps his most famous book, that was about... Um, the kind of diary of beekeeping for a year and inmates takes this astonishingly close look at insects and I think really then opens up beyond that to think about the kind of decline of insect populations and what that 
what that means for the world. Um, and so that's the third um, Project Book Society recommendation for autumn 2020, Sean Borradale's Inmates. And the fourth, um, fourth recommendation for autumn 2020 is Nina Mingia Powell's Magnolia, that's published by Nine Arches Press. Um, a book that's just found itself on the Ford Prize um, for Best First Collection as well. A really astonishing arrival, a really astonishing debut um, that I, I just think, again, is a, is a quite remarkable book. And so I'm really thrilled that it's um, a Poetry Book Society recommendation for Autumn 2020. And the Poetry Book Society choice for Autumn 2020 is Fury by David Morley, um, published by Carcanet. And again, those of you that know... David's work and might have followed it through the years, know that I think he's involved in quite a unique project, which is poetry that really interrogates um, a kind of Romany and traveller history, uses um, kind of Romany language throughout the poems, often with glossaries at the bottom of the poems, kind of speaking up for um, a, a section of society which might other, which oftentimes is is maligned um, and is overlooked and is often um, the subject of horrific racism and abuse and he kind of celebrates that traditional language and the traditions of, of community within that book and Fury actually taking its name from Tyson Fury the boxer as well so I think there's something in there um, for everyone and so there the um, autumn 2020 um, choices and recommendations just to run through them again the choice David Morley for Fury the recommendation Sean Borradale for Inmates Kate Miller The Long Beds Nina Mingia Powell's as Magnolia Mervyn Taylor's Country of Warm Snow um, and the special recommendation Gerda Christney's Reykjavik Requiem um, and I just think it's worthwhile kind of resting on, um, just pointing out as well that this wasn't by design, but as I was just looking back through the list in preparation for tonight's event, to see Ark, to see Shearsman, to see Broken Sleep books there for the translation, to see Carcanet, to see Nine Archers, um, all these really wonderful independent presses that are really the lifeblood of poetry at the minute and doing great things in poetry in this country and have been at the forefront of, of the real renaissance in poetry of the last few years. I think it's really great to see those all um, celebrated on this list um, and long may that continue and long may they continue to publish this really exciting work and so you'll notice that on that list what I didn't read out was the um, wildcard choice for autumn because what I thought I would do is bring in Anthony and Sigoru to talk about the idea of the wild card kind of how he chooses it we'll have a chat about Wayne's book and then just before Anthony goes what I thought I would do is get him to reveal what he's chosen as the autumn 2020 wild card just to get a little bit of you know drama intrigue suspense all the things that Patricia is clearly feeling at this particular moment um, of the book club and so what I'm going to do is, okay, PP got excited when I said book club then. She kind of looked up. It's like a Pavlovian response. She's trained to be excited for the book club. What I'm going to do now is attempt to patch in Anthony. So here's the thing. Those of us that were here last time will know that this is when it went off the rails a bit. But we also learned that Patricia has some tricks up her sleeve that she can entertain us with if things go off the rails. So hopefully... What's going to happen is I'm going to patch in Anthony um, and we're going to have a chat about that notion of the wild card. So here we go. What could. Hey, hey. How are you, man? That, work, that works much better than I thought it would. Yeah, we got there. Yeah, I can. Is this all right? Can you hear me and things okay? Yeah, yeah, this is great. Like, there's no echo. There was a bit of an echo before, but there isn't one on this time so all good excellent well welcome thank you very much for joining us That's all right thanks for having me um and i was just kind of you know chatting about this this notion of the wild card which i think you've been choosing for for a couple of years now is that right yeah i think this is my yeah second year so i think yeah two years i've been doing it for now yeah fantastic and i and i just kind of you know i reeled off a list of all these kind of amazing poets that, you, that you've chosen. So Jennifer Wong, Mimi Calvati, Inua Ellums, Fiona Benson, Sophie Robinson, Zappa, mm. Keneal. And so I just wonder, I mean, it's an incredibly diverse list in terms of, not just in terms of the poets, but I think in terms of the styles that they write in or kind of the different um, kind of technical things, I guess, they bring to poetry. And so I guess I wondered if there was 
is there a kind of particular thing that you're looking for in a wild card? Is there something that suggests itself straight away? Or are you just looking for um, a kind of book that, that really jumps off the page for you? Yeah, I mean, I don't really have a set criteria, which is why I think they're all so different. Um, I think when I read, I, I've kind of trained myself over the years to kind of meet the poem and the and a book of poetry on its own terms rather than trying to force force it to do what I want it to do or what I'd like it to do. So I kind of, once I get my head around the book's argument um, and it's kind of like, it's wider suggestions, then I start to kind of make peace with it. And then it becomes a matter of how well and how convincing it's doing the things that it kind of set out to do. Um, and I kind of feel that it's been like I, I read that way. I appreciate poems in that in that way. So yeah, that's kind of how I've gone about picking this stuff. I love that idea of kind of of, of trying to sort of listen to the argument of the book, and it, you know, because oftentimes with I guess with prizes or with stuff like this, one of the questions that often gets asked, isn't it, is how can you judge two? How do you even judge two books together, let alone kind of all these books? Yeah. And you, isn't it? I think all we can do it eventually, isn't it, is is ask ourselves what that particular book was trying to do yeah. and how successful has it been in doing it. That's the only way to do it, isn't it? We can't, you can't compare books. No, nah, because I don't think we don't write. I mean, poets and, and writers in general don't write to have their books in competition with each other. Yeah. They write to have their books talking to each other. It's part of like a wider kind of communal discourse. And I feel that part of the problem with prize culture is it does pit, it act, act, makes books act as racehorses. And they kind of have to, you know, beat the other book. And I hate that way of thinking about art. And so I kind of put all that out of my head. And I just look at it simply as what is the book trying to do? And how successful has it been in doing that? So I kind of remove myself as much as I can from the equation and meet the book on its own kind of terms. Yeah. I think that's really interesting. So, so in that sense, it becomes not a sense of just kind of chasing a personal preference then of sort because we've all got kind of poetry mm. that we would kind of you know that on on a saturday afternoon we would want to sit down and read because that's our favorite poet or our favorite kind of poetry yeah but actually this sort of selecting or like you say judging and stuff like that should be mm. shouldn't it something beyond that where we put our personal you have to and I, I, yeah i kind of think working as a publisher as well and like having been publishing books for you know six years now it's kind of meant that you have a much broader, more ecumenical kind of taste and, and you just accept things more. Whereas I think as a reader, you can afford to be a little bit more, um, maybe more stiff or more specific with the kind of things that you like. And I kind of feel that you broaden out a bit the more you immerse yourself. Because the thing is, is you realise that if you limit your palate you're, you're limiting the whole experience. So it's it's really about trying to broaden out as much as possible and appreciate appreciate what you can. And do you think, I mean, I think that's so true. And I just wonder, are there books do you think that you've sort of found in that process that you wouldn't necessarily, have, you might not have come across otherwise? Because yeah. I always think about doing this sort of stuff, like Mervyn Taylor, mm. who just uh, um, announced as one of the recommendations, like a poet who... I, I just kind of wasn't aware of, and I found this book, and now I want to go back and read all his earlier stuff. And it, it somehow it opens the door to finding these kind of voices that are new to us as well, doesn't it? Yeah. As well as new voices like Sophie Robinson. I mean, that that's the beauty of it is that I think when you learn to appreciate broadly, um, and and you can see what works trying to do, you yeah, the the the, the range is amazing. Like the things you can get for it. It's a bit like what I do now is I go into bookshops, and if I can build up a rapport with one of the booksellers, I always ask them to recommend me a poetry collection um, or something a little bit off the radar or kind of, you know, a bit peripheral um, just to see what they come with. And like, I, I recently got this Timothy Donnelly album, this uh, album book from a few years back, but he's got a new one coming out this year. Um, and I'd never heard of it before. I'd never heard of, of him even. And it's literally just blown. And that was when I was in Scotland. And I just went into an independent bookshop and said to the guy, can you recommend me something? And he just said, yeah, read this. So, yeah, I feel that. But then, like you say, there is certain things that you definitely do gravitate towards, like technical aspects in a poem. And I feel that is, you know, you can't, you can't move beyond that. There's going to be certain technical things that I like a poem to do. 
And I think that's what, again, if we start thinking about Wayne's book, I think, and, and even the, all the books that I've picked over the last two years, they're all doing yeah. something that definitely piques my interest when it comes to the technical aspect of, of a poem. And what, and I mean, we should we should talk about Wayne's book. So Wayne's book, Love Minus Love, it's now coming out in September. It would have come out in summer, but um, because of everything that's been going on, it's been pushed back slightly. Yeah. But can you remember what it was about it when, when that was sort of in the inbox pile of books that we were all looking through? Can you remember what it was about that that that, that did speak to or, or that made you want to choose? It? I mean, I've I've since Alarum, like I've always been like a big fan of what Wayne does and how he does it. Like I feel that he's a very unique poet in the sense that um, his work resists convention. It resists like the usual logical linear line that a lot of poetry walks down. Um, he disrupts syntax. He plays a lot with very unusual imagery like he takes risks which i really really love and you never get bored i'm never bored in a wayne holloway smith poem like it doesn't have and it's it's you know it's punchy it's got energy to it it moves around it throws you around a little bit it's got all the things that i kind of like and it makes you think and i kind of feel if it can do all those things the poet's done their job you know um and I, that's what happens when when i read this book i started to read it first poem wow second poem cool third poem and it just kept it just kept going and i never felt bored and that's the one thing that i wrestle with i can i can get bored in in a collection if i feel the poet's doing the same thing over and over and over again the same trick or it becomes a bit one note then I can definitely think, all right, I've been here. And I think one of the things with the longer collections, the good thing about the UK, and I think um, your dad mentioned this at the Elliot's as well, is that we've kind of gone into like the slim volume, which, yeah. and the Americans are like big on like having a collection of poetry, with, like 80 poems in, and it's difficult to sustain energy and pace for like that amount of time. So yeah, I feel that love minus love really was doing was doing a lot of work and in quite a short controlled kind of way space i think it's really true as well when you say that it, it's just never boring mm. which i think is a really important thing like you're saying i think i read a lot of books where they're they're not bad by any stretch of the imagination but they're kind of what i would often call like plausible yeah. they're just kind of plausibly good and they probably be, they feel like they've been worked on quite a lot they feel quite watertight right, right, right. i'd be happy to have written any of the poems in them but it feels like there's almost nothing on the line yeah. or there's no risk in it and i think in a lot of like what you're saying with wayne stuff with a lot of the humor the kind of quite dark side of a lot of it as well the really kind of the odd kind of textual things that are happening in it there's that fear that at some point if you turn the page it might fail yeah. or it might fall off the kind of tightrope that it's walking and that that's what gives it its energy, I guess, isn't it? Oh, that's what I want from a book. Yeah, and, and I think to do it in such a way where you feel... I mean, a lot of his poems orbit. They don't necessarily have an arc. They don't have a trajectory. They orbit a theme. They orbit a subject matter. And I think that's really difficult to pull off. But I love the, the kind of materiality of the poem, the lateral shifts, the way that it kind of moves in and around its own kind of space. Um, and it, it's very difficult to pull that off, I think, as a writer and keep your reader concerned for the speaker, but also invested in the subject as well. You know, and I think Wayne brings in quite a few different subjects and, and fuses them in a quite seamless way where you don't realise that you're actually being being given several different, quite disparate things all in one. Yeah, it's quite, it's really impressive. And like you said, and they always have, despite the kind of, the playfulness and the humour and the surrealism that's in there, yeah. they have such a heart, I think, yeah. don't they? Like they I, it's, there's such a sincerity in there as well. I, it's not for the sake yeah. you, you, I think it's that. It's a bit like, you know, when, when, when I've done workshops or I've, I think about my own poetry, it's about having that sense of conviction, having, a, having an argument in there that the reader thinks, you know what, I believe the poet. Like I, this is coming from a place of, of sincerity. And I think, yeah, Wayne, there's heart, there's emotion, but there's also there's also a lot of brain going on. There's a lot of head work going on as well. So I, I, I don't know, like it just, and I, going back, like all the books, I think that over the period of time have been doing that in their own independent way. And that's what makes everything so remarkable. Yeah, fantastic. Um, so, I mean, well, I mean, this is all, I guess, 
things that I want to ask Wayne about mm. as well. I wonder, um, because I've just sort of reeled off the list of, of books that are um, autumn 2020 uh, recommendations and choices. If you wanted to reveal to us what the autumn wildcard is for 2020. Yeah, I picked Rachel Long's uh, My Darling from the Lions, um, which was... Tell us about that. Um, I mean, yeah, it was another one where from the moment I opened it up and started to read, I was just, I was involved. You know, it's almost, and, and you never really hear, hear page turners being associated with poetry books. You know, it was a page turner, but I kind of felt that it was that. I could, I did it in one sitting, then I left it for a day. I came back and read it again. And I was like, this is great. Um, and I, I just feel that there's something special. There's something different that she's doing in the book. I mean, she fuses satire, wit. There's a kind of, there's a dark kind of insidious bubbling that is going on throughout the poem like there's this undertone that you know, it's quite uncomfortable as a reader to sit on it throughout the whole period but it's there it's constantly nagging and it's really well positioned within the poems kind of subtextually so yeah and, and again the subjects i think are really important you know she's talking about race about the body sexuality lust desire how all these things relate um and she's just done it in a way that that I feel is is necessary for yeah. for the times. Fantastic! What a great choice to have made. Um, and it just makes me think. Before we finish, do you think there is this new gen? I mean, obviously we're still very young, but do you think there is a kind of new generation of poets coming up who, like, of who I put um, kind of all these poets really that we've been talking about, kind of behind us somehow, like Rachel and think Nina, who we've, um, Nina Minga Powell's as well. Um, Ella Frias, who we've talked to on this before, like there's this entire generation of poets coming up behind us that I think are, are kind of taking things forward and, and, and kind of taking poetry forward in really exciting ways. Yeah, I mean, for sure. And, and I think it's really, really encouraging to see. Um, I, just, I, I just want more poetry that takes risks. I want more poetry that isn't scared, to, like isn't just trying to get on a short list or isn't just trying to get a good review in The Guardian. Like I just want poetry that is beyond, that transcends all that stuff and is, and is, is just doesn't compromise itself. I think that's the most important part, you know, that just lives in this space and is doing its own thing. I just started reading D.S. Marriott, um, Duppies, and wow, like, yeah, I don't know. Like, it's just completely knocked me back. Um, and so I think, yeah, I think you're right. Like, I think there is a generation who are coming up, who, who are literally, who are doing that, who are pushing against convention and, and giving us writing that is arresting and vital, but interesting and genuine at the same time. Like, it's, yeah, it's a good, it's a good time to be writing and reading. And publishing. <laughs> yeah. Well, I don't know about financially, but definitely <laughs> everything else for sure, yeah. Oh, thank you so much for, for joining us and having this chat. No worry. Thanks, thanks for having uh, me down. Sorry that Patricia's been asleep, but don't take that personally. She just sleeps through everything. That's all right, man. I'm used to it by now. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I'm going to do technical wisdom where I kind of kick you out and then get Wayne in. Cool, yeah, do it. Uh, but thank you very much for no this. No worries. Um, we'll have a chat about Rachel's book at some point in the future. Definitely, definitely. Look after yourself. Really, you too, man. See you thank later. you. Bye. So there we have Anthony Annex Agoru brilliantly kind of, I think, talking about poetry that, that takes risks, which is what we want, poetry that doesn't wrestle on its levels, poetry that isn't trying to get on a list. Um, and talking about Rachel Long, who's the Poetry Book Society wildcard choice for autumn 2020. But now, through the magic of Twitter again, um, Twitter, Instagram, I don't even know where I am anymore. Things are getting lost. Um, I'm going to bring in Wayne um, Holloway-Smith, who is then um, going to chat to us about his book if it works it's been going very well so far i'm very suspicious of this technology going so well it can only go wrong from here um we're waiting for wayne we're waiting for wayne hello and he's here hello can you hear me i can hear you i can see you can you hear and see us i can hear and see you very well we've got matching spectacles almost which is enjoyable well, I feeling that you've outdone me on the spectacle well i remember because I, I had those ones and then you got the ones that look kind of smoother and then i was like oh well, what am i going to do next i've got to get the ri most ridiculously big pair ever but now next time you see me i'm just going to have like 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, um, what was that snooker player? Uh, Dennis something. He had like ones that were like out here. Or that scene in The Simpsons where they pull out bigger and bigger spoons. That's exactly what I'm after, yeah. Maybe we should just move to spoons next, actually. I'm going to... Can I'm like echoing a bit, so I don't know what to do with my volume. Um, is it echoing for you lot? No, it sounds good, I think. People are liking the shirts. Sheepish says that I've got a nice shirt. I've got a, my buttons are a bit undone. Sorry. Dennis Taylor, Jill Abram says, and that is correct. There we go. Well done. So, well, welcome, Wayne, and congratulations on being... We can't just talk about glasses all evening, or maybe we can um, congratulations on being the summer 2020 wildcard choice. Cheers. Uh, for Love Minus Love, which is coming out in September now, isn't it? So it's been moved back a few months. Yeah. Um, do you want to give us a point from it to start us off? Yeah. Well, on the old email, you, do you want one or two? Cause... Let's have two. They're real short. They're all basically. So the, the thing about the book is that it's kind of all just one long fragmentary poem really so none of them have none of the pages or bits in it have um titles or whatever they all just kind of jumble together uh so i'll just read two bits from that that aren't next to each other in the book if that's all right um so no title oh, yeah that's so one of the bits uh it kind of borrows let's say from a scene in Ghost, starring Patrick Swayze and Demi Moore, and Whoopi Goldberg, and um, it's my mum's favourite movie. I remember her coming back from the cinema and keeping me up late as a 10-year-old so she could explain rigorously the plot to me and telling me how much it made her cry, and et cetera. So we'll, um, we'll, uh, that'll, that'll come up. All right, I'll read this and I'll try not to disappear out of it. The first thing I ever did over the internet, a reading, you were in it. And um, it, was, it was for Poetry Extension. And I oh, basically yeah. disappeared so you could just see my chin like that while I was reading the whole time. <laughs> and I got rinsed by, by all my mates afterwards, so I'm going to try not to do that now. All right. Keep the photo of my dad smoking and looking like James Dean. I've been so lovingly breathed into by the empty promise of that cigarette, that kiss curled head and the black and white photo. He is my age or younger. He's maybe 15 in that photo, back knuckled to his own dad's barn door. He's slender in two tight jeans. He's going to do something shallow, soon and very bad. I'm trying hard to follow his example, but I don't want to die. I can't seem to lift a heavy thing or get into fights past the lighter. I just like smoking and watching TV. Silent, like his photo. In his eulogy, they said he loved beef, always beef in his sandwiches. His hair is receding. He is being very attractive in his photo. He's going to do something very soon. He's gone. It's already done. Here's your mother. She is Demi Moore with short black hair. It's the early 90s. She's not got much on, sitting at her pottery wheel. The Righteous Brothers are singing about love. It might be raining outside and dark, and she's getting pretty messy there in all that clay. You might expect... You might think at this moment the well-toned, the shirtless husband might arrive behind her in tight black jeans, but nothing, only the record spinning and the empty symbol of the half-finished jar lengthening on that wheel. There's two... Thank you so much for that. That was just great. And it is, I think, I mean, were you listening to what Anthony was saying about the book as well? Yeah. I was, and then I was, I was looking, he was saying stuff, and I was looking at the poems, thinking, oh shit, did they do that? Have I chosen the ones that do that? <laughs> and then what I realised is, the way that Anthony was describing how one poem does its thing, like mm. things that he enjoys, I feel like that's what I'm trying to do by, in the whole book, as one page relates to the others, you know what I mean? So instead of one line jumping and becoming unexpected and the lateral shift, as he said, which I enjoyed because I thought you boys both go to the gym. I thought a lateral shift was one of those ones that you do. That's not a lateral <laughs> shift. 
What was that called? I mean, I've not been in so long. Right, yeah, I suppose, I suppose this whole period is playing with the uh, gym terminology a bit. But yeah, I was thinking, I, I, was thinking I, I want to do that, but on a wider scale, like throughout the book, as one page and one moment relates to the other, rather than just doing it in the single bits, um, like I've done before. That's really exciting, because I was thinking about whether to call this your second collection, because in between there was I Can't Wait for the Wending. Yeah. Which, which I want to kind of grab from the shelf, but I can't quite reach it. So this kind of astonishing kind of um, sheet of, of cards, wasn't it? So a poem on each kind of card, yeah. which could in theory be kind of shuffled and read in different directions and kind of read in different ways. And I used them in workshops, so I've kind of like handed them around a classroom, kind of one to each person and things like that. And we yeah. read them in different orders. And so was that another way of thinking about this same construction of this book? Then? Yeah. That, that there might not be one single way of of pulling together, you know, because like Anthony was saying, we think of a, a standard collection as kind of being poems and they might have a bit of an arc and, and they kind of, they're all very self-contained and very plausible. Yeah. Whereas the, you, you, you want to do something different then is what you're saying. It just gets boring, doesn't it? It's the same thing over and over again. But I was thinking the other day, you know, like if you keep measuring what a good poem is by like older criteria, then how are we going to get any new poems? Like, if, it's the same, like, if we're trying to measure, like, what a good song is by how much it sounds like Bob Dylan, then we're just going to get a bunch of Bob Dylan cover acts. And in the same way, I don't want to be, like, a Seamus Heaney cover act or a Simon Armitage. Do you know what I mean? I don't want to do... I don't want the my kind of way of writing to defer or operate in deference to... Um, people that have gone before me as the same as you mentioned like the young'uns that are coming up now that are doing stuff that I'm desperate to learn from you know what I mean like I'm really excited about some people and not just like the people who are bringing books out now but the people that haven't got books out I'd like Tice Anderson's one that I think they're just an incredible poet and I, I sat in a pub with Tice and just like so what are you doing and they were like oh it's this kind of and I was like all oh, right, yeah, yeah, cheers. Uh, can I, is it all right if I jump in on that a bit? And they're like, yeah, go for it. You know, and it's a, a, a way of being intergenerationally generous, I think. So we're all moving on in our art form, uh, maybe, yeah. So then, like, because there's a lot of poets that um, kind of listen to this or kind of tune in and things like that, on a really technical level, how do you write like that? Kind of how do you begin to construct a collection that, where the where there are those kind of different strands in it or where things don't necessarily kind of just you know you're not doing here's a single poem self-contained here's another single poem self-contained yeah. in your head kind of how just technically how do you go about kind of writing a book that's as that's as kind of good and as accomplished as this do you write the individual pieces of it or are you writing it as a kind of is it a tapestry that you're just kind of working on bit by bit I think you intuitively know that it's going to be bigger than like a, a singular poem, yeah. and um, and so you and it's not like a novel or something that you map out. You just know, okay, I'm writing a moment now, and I have enough confidence to know that there'll be something else that emerges, that um, yeah, that that sort of speaks to that a little bit later on or whatever, or maybe I've already written it. And also, I just see them as, I don't know, like, bits. I never see anything as finished, I don't think. So, um, I'm, like, even when I handed this over to Neil uh, Bloodaxe, there was a bit of me that was like, what's missing? You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah give me it back, Neil. Which is what I did <laughs> with Alarum loads. I was like, hold on, can I just... And this time, I was a bit more just like, all right. One of my mates was like, there's a, there's a point where you just got to stop writing. Yeah. And and that's just what what I did with with um that uh the Wendin uh box of poem, but I just yeah. wrote that all in three days, so it was a a bit of a different experience. Like I hit upon a thing that I wanted to do, but that was kind of like you were saying a bit of an experiment in terms of working out how I might put together another book. I just wanted to see how poems could move, and also how people might respond to it as well. Like, Well, and someone's mentioning Joseph Figlock, who turns up in one of the poems. And yeah, that's true. Who is this sheepish person? I'm starting to like him. 
you're getting shout outs. You've just got fans that love it. That's great. Yeah. Um, it's been relentlessly reading on Instagram all week so far. Well, I did one yesterday, my first ever Instagram thing, and it, I think it went all right. But then I was thinking, I can't read any of the same poems bits today that I did yesterday in case people are like, he's only got like four or five. <laughs> not quite in this Love Minus Love book. There's only four pages in there. So, <laughs> oh, it's oh Neil. that's Neil. <laughs> Amazing. Neil's nice. You've only said nice things about him, so it's fine. Yeah, yeah, I've only said good things. So, One of the things that struck me just then as you were talking when you said you sort of get a moment and then you follow it and you have the confidence to know that it's going to turn into something else. Yeah. Because I, what Anthony was really hitting on as well that I think was really great is this notion that there's such a kind of joyous experimentation in these poems and a kind of really exuberant yeah. and a, a risk-taking. In, not, in not necessarily... Um, to suggest that it's kind of incredibly avant-garde and mad as anything, but there's a there's a risk in that a lot of people wouldn't dare write like this. Mo most people are comfortable going, "Here's my twenty line poem that's got a beginning, middle, and end. Yeah. And it's self contained It's about this." And like you know, I just write about my garden now. That's what I do. I just write little poems about my garden, and then they're done. That's all. But whereas there's something, is there ever a fear that, or kind of, is that is is the fear what drives it for you? Do you think that yeah. sense of it's it's my name. Page. I've got to get to the next bit. Yeah, and, it's like uh, juggling a bunch of balls at the same time and ho and being scared you're going to drop them at any minute. It's that kind of thing. I'm like, oh, when's it when the when it drops? Like the poem's done. But also, like when when I get bored or when I feel like the energy is running out, I just do something else. Do you know what I mean? It's like, oh, this is getting well, but if I'm getting bored by this, like, no one else is going to read it. I'm going to do something different. I think that there's, that's one of the things that I am really mindful of is, like, like the reader shows us poets a lot of empathy, don't they? An empathetic act in picking up our book and giving time to it and reading it and whatever. And often I felt like in the past I've read books where I don't really think, like, the poet returns the favour, you know? And I'm thinking, well, how can I be empathetic to the reader? And they've got, to, if in any kind of social exchange, like, there's got to be some give and take, hasn't there? Like, no, at the party, I get wild drunk and talk to someone in a corner about how evil neoliberalism is. And I can't really get away with that. Like, they, I'm never invited back to parties for some reason. I don't want to be like that guy in the, in the poems, you know what I mean? There needs to be... I, there, there needs to be something for the reader and like some kind of like, almost reward for for being generous enough to bother reading the work or stuff like that. And, and is that then the emotional heart of them? Because these are also, I think, incredibly moving poems, very kind of honest poems, radically kind of sincere poems as well. Yeah. Even around the kind of linguistic playfulness, around even the kind of typography playfulness. There's that sincerity in them. Is that what is that what you're kind of giving back to the reader in that sense? That a bit of like hopefully like that kind of surprise, that kind of like, oh my god, is this gonna? How's this gonna work? And then if it does, if they do think it works, hopefully they do. Then then there's a payoff, and you're like, oh wow, that was oh, that was good. That was enjoyable, you know. As opposed to like, I kind of know where this is going, and then it goes there, and you're like, all right, well. Okay, good. Well, he wrote the competent poem that I expected. In terms of sincerity and stuff like that, um, and and honesty and vulnerability, I think it's been really important to do that. When I first started writing, because I'm obviously from like quite a working class background and that, I felt I had a lot to prove. So I needed to prove that I was clever and I could use big words and whatever. And then I realised that was just a pretense. And maybe I should just be honest about the things that I've been through and the things that are uh, that I'm insecure about. And it's probably more brave and interesting and important to do that sort of stuff. You know, speaking about mental illness, speaking about having eating disorders and anxiety and stuff. It's probably something that people need to read way more than a huge amount of polysyllabic words in a certain meter, you know. Perhaps. Well, there's something that I, I hopefully, anyway, yeah.
And irony as well. Like, who gives a fuck about irony, man? It's so... Ironic distance now. Like, I'm just not interested in it. I, I understand why people use it, and it has been enjoyable, but I can't... I can't... At this moment in time, like, I've got no... Yeah, it's a privilege that I don't have I think, to use that. I think... I mean, you're singing from my hymn sheet, I think, to a certain, you know, I agree with everything you're saying, but I think that, that movement of irony for our generation, I think, has been really interesting. Yeah. That, that we, that just that not even in poetry, just as a generation, yeah. we came to a kind of hyper-ironic yeah. kind of space, didn't we? And now actually maybe coming out the other side of that, as you're saying, to something that recognises the need once again for empathy, for solid, um, for sincerity. Yeah. In, in a way that we that maybe wasn't necessary before. I think that's really interesting. But also, uh, the irony thing is it's a, it's a structural and hierarchical thing that places certain people. There's a power dynamic in how irony is used. And I'm not interested in placing myself above other people, like through poetry, but also socially. Like, you know, like you're talking irony, like in terms of my friendship circle, but also in terms of my peer group in, in uh, educational institutions. Like that was a real way of kind. There was a violence to it that I was just super into. So maybe I've in, in, the two. I'm wearing this, but I'm doing it ironically. I'm, I'm also shopping there, but it's ironic. And so right. it's like, yeah, I, I've got these kit things, like I'm wearing tracksuit bottom. You know, like Amy Key once said to me, we were at some, in fact, it was, I probably shouldn't say, but we were somewhere and there were loads of clearly quite well-off people wearing like the sort of trousers that were tracksuit bottoms that we just wore because that's what our parents bought us like but now there's a kind of um currency to it isn't there there's a knowingness and a currency um that that it is it, it operates as a sort of um class distinct distinction or something like pierre bourdieu yeah. talks about that a little bit who i love i tripped over his grave actually pierre bourdieu um, on my way to see Oscar Wilde's grave, um, this is the guy that basically I lent on so heavily to write my PhD, and I physically tripped over his grave. There's got to be some kind of sim symbol there that I haven't quite been clever enough to unpack. <laughs> well, I mean, I, I wanted to ask another question. Because you mentioned that, I'll kind of, I'll come a different way into it, I guess. Um, Kind of who, and this is what I've been asking a lot of people, I guess. That like you mentioned the PhD, but who are the, who are the poets? Do you think, or who are the thinkers that, if this book, if this, if Love Minus Love kind of had an ingredients list, kind of who would be in it? Do you think? Oh man, there's so many, isn't it? Like, I mean, always like like um, Professor Beverly Skeggs, who the last I heard, she writes about class and uh, gender, etc in a way that kind of blew my mind a bit. I lent both of her books to Rachel Adams, never given them back. So we all need to get on that and pressure Rachel Allen to give me those books back. But um, it's so embarrassing about Beverly Skeggs that I literally sent her a fan mail. Like one of those ones where it's like, you don't even need to reply. I just want you to know. And then she, her reply was, um, wow. And that was it. I was like, I don't know whether that's a positive thing or whether you're murking me or something. Um, so her, and then just so many, I, I don't, it's not necessarily collections for me, but like individual poems that, and it, yeah, that have written by a, a, a whole wide range of poets that, that I've admired and, and still do, you know, go back to and that. So I don't, it's really hard to pin the ingredients, but, it, but in, interestingly in this, in this book, I hear lots of people kind of borrow from uh, writers and uh, write versions of things. Well, this, this book actually directly includes some of my influences, like words from some of my influences, like from like Bow Hooks to Franz Kafka. Like it, it, it kind of is quite honest about that. And it's not quite dialogue with them but it, it really wears it it allows the voices to actually just say what they said instead of yeah. me 
kind of ventriloquizing them or or kind of appropriating the words in some way i kind of just thought i'm i'm just going to let them speak and hopefully that adds to some kind of texture in terms of what i was trying to achieve i guess although i'm not really sure what i was trying to achieve like you know anthony and you were both talking about making an argument i put making his argument yeah. not really sure what the argument was like or what the point was i don't think i was trying working to a theme or whatever i, I just kind of writing and and trying to use it as a way of understanding where i am and my own subjective place in the world and all that well i think that 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 seems to me one of the really key things because i mean i've got two things i wanted to really quickly ask i guess one is joseph biglock's been mentioned kind of in the comments and that's one of the things that is kind of a character in one of the, I don't want to spoil it, is a character in one of the poems in this kind of like, kind of terrifying kind of parable or kind of story about a baby that falls out of a building and things like that. And then there are other ones like the tallest cow in the world and things like that, yeah. where we get almost kind of like, I guess kind of like national myths or somehow like parables or fables that are then folded into, it seems to me, kind of very personal feelings. Yeah. So that just speaks about the idea of the kind of the, the, the subjective place of the self within the world. Sometimes it's trying to find that through kind of biggest things, isn't it? Or the way the world can fold into the self somehow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I think it's happening. So both of those were like bits that were included in the uh, I Can't Wait for the Wending box. And I think, you know, like, uh, Audrey Lord says about like there's there's a kind of pre-lingual or pre-verbal feeling that there are experiences of the of the world that we don't have a vocabulary to express, and actually, like poetry might be the best that we've got in terms of developing a vocabulary. So like, so when the PBS asked me to write my bit of the bulletin, I kind of just said yeah. that you know. Um, if I could put it into words and explain what I was doing or trying to talk about, then I wouldn't need to write a poem about it, you know? The, the, the only idea that I had or the only kind of loose thing that I was thinking when I was writing those type of poems is, like, a lot of identity is just, like, contingent upon so much other stuff that's external to us, like where we were born, who's in government, like um, the peers that we come into contact with, whether something bad happened to you when you were young, like, um, you know, accidents, uh, whether you lose your job, all of that stuff um, kind of directly impacts who we are and how we're able to be in the world. So I was trying to think about how that might be expressed in terms of poems, like the book itself, I can't wait for the wending. Is just um, my daughter wrote it. She meant to write "I can't wait for the wedding," and she wrote "I can't wait for the wending." And I asked her, "Could I use that for the title?" And uh, like the order of the, you know, you were saying that that there's these cards that are kind of mixed up. Well, I wanted the order and the kind of whatever the narrative might be to be dictated by the reader's choice, like as opposed to me ordering them, you know. And the cow and the figlock and that were just weird coincidences that I Googled. I was like, I Googled weird coincidences, spent a whole night reading them. And I was thinking, how can these kind of, which I've really coincidentally just stumbled upon, how can they become part of a language through which I might be able to express bits of my own emotional experience? And I kind of try and do that a bit more throughout the whole love minus love. But one of the, I mean... In, in In Love Minus Love, I think, and on a really, I guess, geekish point, one of the things that really excites me about it are the things that it's doing with the language itself on the page. So sometimes, I mean, how best to explain it, sometimes the kind of space is missing between words. So we almost get a kind of slam together effect of kind of like Viking pennies. Yeah. Sometimes the language is struck through. Um, sometimes we're kind of using the whole body of the space of the page. Yeah. And I just wonder is... Does the poem come out and then it feels like it needs, it's only part of it until it has something visual with it? Or is that just how it appears kind of on, like it's not, it's not a way I've ever written and I'm just fascinated by how that, how one constructs something like that. Because it's such a fantastic dynamic within the book, I think. 
Oh, I'm glad you think that because when I was doing it, I was like, no one's gonna, you know. <laughs> um, I think that happens as I go. Like you kind of because it, it feels quite improvised a lot of the time. I'm literally improvising as I go, so the words jumbled, joined up or whatever. Apart from those, those are often the words. I use that a bit sometimes to separate my own work from the work that I was kind of including, like by the poets that I, the, the writers that I admire, but also um, it feels like that's how it sounds in my head when I'm, when I'm writing. So the words that are all, all joined up uh, kind of just happen because of that's the way that it feels it should do. It's the same if I need to break a line or put a space somewhere or not. Like often that that it just feels intuitively right or whatever, uh, but you can. I don't think that there's a there's one way of doing this. It's not like a right or wrong way. You just got to sort of do your best <laughs> guess, yeah, yeah. your best guesses or something. Fantastic. Well, um, we're sort of coming up towards the end of our time, Wayne. I wondered if you wanted to just read us a couple more, a couple more things. Yeah, I will. I, I feel like I should have that Josie Piglock yeah. one now, but I am. Um, I don't know where it is because I don't have it in a book at the moment. I've just got these. Got to wait, leave people waiting. They can buy the book. They can buy the book. Yeah. If you want to read that Josie Piglock poem, you're going to have to buy this book when it eventually comes out. There's, uh, it's available to pre order. Okay. Pre order on books.com and Great. the Poetry Book Society website. Yeah. Both of those. Get two. Get one from Blood Axe and one from the PBS, just to make it fair. <laughs> this is the only poem that I read last night that I'm going to read again, and it, it, it nicks an anecdote from uh, Patty Smith's Just Kids. Here's your mother. She is Patty Smith and gazes hungry in November in 1969 in Manhattan in the Horn and Harder automat upon a sandwich in a vending machine behind its glass with one dime less in her hand than she needs. Just then your dad appears dressed as Allen Ginsberg, buys her the sandwich, and now she has to sit and listen to him talk about Walt Whitman for the rest of his life. But instead of talking about Walt Whitman, he is silent. Suddenly they are both rotated 90 degrees to the left, and instead of an automat, there are only armchairs, a carpeted living room, a TV. I want you to leave your body now, he tells me. His voice not so much hypnotic as reaching for the hypnotic. But I leave it anyway, sitting in the upright chair of the windowless room for a place that's higher up that's not quite the windowless room. Though I'm aware of my body's particular kind of breathing down there dressed in my favourite shirt and somehow up here I'm dressed in that same shirt which is, I feel, becoming very important. Its colour pertaining to a quiet hue of knowing I can't quite explain and I do not think about the money I have given him, the man who is speaking, but instead I'm looking down on a yellow kitchen in Swindon upon a tiny remembered body I have found crying or about to cry in little white shorts and there is carpet streets with blue and there is the noise of a terrible thing that is happening and there is summer outside with its other children he doesn't understand does he says the man he is so young and i understand the shirt that he will have to grow through all of the terrible things to fit i can feel my body now filling up the space inside its soft lavender scented cotton Beautiful. Thank you so much. I've got 45 seconds left before Instagram kicks us out. Just to say thank you very much to everyone for joining us. Thank you very much to you, Wayne, most of all. One of my favourite poets, one of my favourite people in the world. Love Minus Love is just a remarkable book. And I urge everyone to pre-order it. Um, coming out in September. Um, so get hold of that. Um, look out on the Poetry Book Society website for more offers. If you join at the minute, you get £10 spend in the shop. So you could spend that pre-ordering Wayne's book. Um, and we've just announced the autumn selections and so um, we'll be doing another series of Instagram book clubs I'm sure um, where we can 
um, talk about those as well. So thank you very much, Wayne. And Patricia has enjoyed it as well, but she's been sleeping all the way through. <laughs>